Hello. Great. So uh, my name is John. I'll just get going because we're looks like we're right on time. Uh, yeah. So unfortunately, I was not able to make it. I had something pop up last minute. So apologies. I was really looking forward to see everybody. But I'm, I'm happy to talk virtually today. So let's get going. I'm going to talk about application network security uh, in an encrypted future. So this is a problem we're starting to see. It's not something we see every day um, yet, but I, th I think it's be going to become more and more prevalent. Um, so as a quick agenda, first I'll talk about Tetragon. Tetragon is our security tool um, uh, that I work on um, where we're starting to kind of see this problem and we're looking for a solution. Um, we'll show you kind of like what we do with L7 today as far as parsers go and how it works. Um, and, then, and then talk about a little bit about why it, it can break in some scenarios. Um, and then, you know, how we solve it with VPF um, and so on. All right, so let's get started. Um, so what is Tetragon? A little bit about that. Uh, uh, no, I've talked about it a few places, other places. I don't think I've talked about it at LPC before. So um, Tetragon is a security um, observability and runtime enforcement. Uh, this is kind of important because it impacts our, our kind of viewpoint of the world, kind of especially when we talk about trust domains and stuff in a couple more slides. But the gist is it does all of the, the BPF filtering and enforcement in the in the kernel. Um, this is really driven by we need CPU, we need memory, and we need correctness. Um, so the, the users are really watching CPU and memory usage. So any sort of bumps in CPU or memory usage um, almost always ends up with a bug. Um, in my inbox, usually a high priority bug because they've just upgraded a cluster and now they see, you know, a 5% boost in CPU, on, which means that I get to work on solving that problem um, kind of as quickly as possible or roll back their deployment. Um, so a lot of that means that we do as much as possible in the BPF kernel. This avoids sending events to user space over the perf ring, for example, um, which would wake up user space cause more CPU processing and so on. Um, and then as part of that, we move as much state into the kernel as possible. So we have um, an exec tree, a kind of a mirror of everything that's been executed. Um, we have a, a whole bunch of socket maps so we can map sockets to their processes. So if anywhere in the kernel, you get a socket hook or a function with a socket, you can then find the process even if there's no current uh, pointer to the task, for example. Um, we also move all of the Kubernetes metadata into the kernel. So the kernel has a notion of what a pod is. And if, if you don't too familiar with Kubernetes, a pod is, is really a network namespace, some C groups and these kinds of things. Um, but there's also a concept of labels and namespaces in Kubernetes, which is like an abstraction of that. A group of pods can be in a namespace. Certain pods can have arbitrary labels. Um, we, we teach the kernel all of these things so that in the kernel, we can um, filter events based on pod labels and namespaces, or we can enforce certain prim, um, and certain things based on those as well. Um, you can imagine only certain system calls are allowed by certain pods, or only certain system calls are allowed in namespaces. And a, lo a lot of times when you construct a Kubernetes environment, you'll have kind of, uh, higher privileged namespaces. Usually cube system is one of them. This is like where you put all your system utilities. Then you might have like one for Tetragon itself, which is a security domain. Then you might have a bunch for different users and different types of users. Um, so by pushing all this in the kernel, along with all the state that we maintain about sockets and files and exec trace uh, executables, we can then really, really bring down um, this kernel to user space um, chatter, um, which then brings down the CPU overhead. Um, and I think that was a theme uh, that was also brought up yesterday in Meta's discussion, right? Do we really want to push everything into the kernel? There's also a correctness reasons to do this. Um, you want to make sure that if you um, if you if you require annotations from user space, it, it can become racy if you're not very very careful. Um, you also um, the next kind of bullet here is we also do a lot of hooks inside the kernel, not just on the system calls. This is primarily to avoid um, talk tau kind of issues um, where you might want to filter, for example, on a socket address. You know, if you're looking at a connect event, you might want to only allow certain types of connects, for example, connect to certain IP addresses and so on. Um, 
but that's a user pointer in, in the syscall, so you can't rely on that, um, or you're going to race with user space. And you know, again, that goes back to us being a security tool, um, and so we don't our kind of trust domain, which I'll point out later, doesn't include the user. Um, we can't trust their input. Um, and then the last piece here, a bullet that I think kind of makes it distinctive is we do all the enforcement in line. Um, there are some VPF-based tooling that, for example, will push the event to user space and then generate um, an alert and then maybe stop the process or stop the pod, um, which is which is kind of a good first step. But the problem with that is that the actions already happened, right? And so we do this through multiple different ways. Um, we use the override to override certain return codes. We often send signals to the application to kill them. Um, and we also use LSMs um, as well when they're available. So that's kind of the high level overview. Um, I'll show you a couple of things that we can produce with this um, that we use for it. Um, kind of from a visibility side, here's kind of a laundry list of things that, that people are using Tetragon today for. Um, for this kind of talk, the really interesting ones are the last two here, LSAM and parsing and, and DNS, HTTP and TLS. Um, that's what we're going to focus on, but you can also see we can do kind of process execution, um, you know, which we, we also support digests and, Sh and SHA-256 over those through IMA and FS Verity. Um, but also these kind of other things, uh, namespace changes, privileges, capabilities, CVE mitigation. So there's there's some uh, some ways if you know a CVE and you know kind of know the pattern, you can um, kind of implement a, a policy that would block that pattern. Um, but like I said, let's talk about the networking side of things because that's the most interesting for today. And then what we do once we collect all this networking information is we usually push this up either to a um, into cold storage into a SIM or into application, um, some of our UI application stuff that iSurveillance has. Um, this is just an example of one um, visualization that we have. So on the left, you can see we have an exec trace. Um, in this case, node server.js is this, the kind of the first thing. It's coming from a pod that's called crawler. Um, and you can see the container runtime stuff as you go higher. And eventually, you get to init, which is the kind of thing that starts all this thing. But Basically, what we're seeing is all the binaries that are executed inside a pod um, in kind of a tree form on the left. And then on the right, we have all of their, um, what they connect to. And you see we get uh, DNS names because we have a DNS parser, uh, and we get ports and TCP information. The DNS names come from that DNS parser as well. Um, and you can't see it here because it's a static picture. But if you, you kind of zoomed in on these right boxes, you could also see um, kind of the HTTP requests, what, what was sent, if it was a Git or a post or whatever. And the idea here is that security um, operators or, or the platform operators can look at this and they can see things that, are, that they don't expect, like a malicious bucket here is, is our sort of canary that we are highlighting. Um, we, don't expect, we don't expect this connection, so um, that's a problem. But there's also an interesting piece where sort of just basic networking wouldn't solve the problem where you see a malicious user talking to, um, to something like Elastic Tenant jobs here. So this looks like it's an okay connection because the node server is allowed to talk to it. So if you're a, if you're a system that's running um, kind of in the, as a middle box in the network or OVS or something in the, in the networking side, you wouldn't really be able to distinguish this these two connections, this one from the good node server.js and then perhaps one from curl, which you may not expect, right? These are two different binaries, both connecting to a valid source. Um, so that's the advantage of digging deeper into the system beyond just, um, just pure networking um, and tying it back all the way back to the binaries, not just the source IPs, for example. Um, so another example is then, um, because I want to talk about HTTP a little bit in a second, the other thing we can do um, kind of at isovalent when we work, at, work with Tetragon data is we can generate dashboards of HTTP events. Um, this is generated from um, stock map, basically. Um, it's, it's a pair of programmers and parsers, and I'll walk through that flow in a second on how that actually works. But you can see we parse the data, we can generate um, pretty graphs with latency metrics. Um, um, this is a latency graph right here, and also return code. So you can see uh, I got a bunch of 200s or a bunch of 503s you might want to investigate. Um, or if you see a, a high P99 latency here on the bottom left middle kind of, um, you might want to go and take a look. So these are, these are some things we can do with the data. Um, but uh, we have to do file access, but I'll skip through that slide in the interest of time. Um, 
So those are some things we do with the data. Um, then I want to talk briefly about the trust model that we employ um, because it, it's going to become relevant in just a second. The This is a sketch um, that I put together of kind of a typical Kubernetes uh, model. And in Kubernetes, we have these pods. Um, from the kernel side, you can just imagine these are network namespaces and C groups, kind of capabilities, user namespaces, all kind of grouped together in a series of applications and containers. Um, so we we usually connect, there's usually a local networking running there, IP tables, a net device, um, maybe NetKit if you, if you follow the last talk. Um, and then on the host, we have another net device. I kind of went with the VETH model here. It's the most standard at the moment, um, at least that we see on kind of 510, 515 kernels. And then you kind of have a net device out of the system. All right, so this is a, a kind of a basic, straightforward model. Like we can make it more complex if we wanted to, but it serves our purpose for this. So then we want to talk about like what does our trust trust boundary look like, um, and where can we hook into the kernel to get our data? So you could conceivably build a library to hook into the um, into the the data, like an HTTP library that you know everyone uses to send their data. You could hook into that and, and put your observability hooks there. Um, unfortunately for us, that's not going to work from a security standpoint because we we don't trust these containers. We're, we're, very, we're taking the approach that you know we're on the security team side, and we don't want to trust um, trust the pod or the container, and also the application, um, which also rules out U probes, um, which is unfortunate because U probes. Uh, would be nice because you could hook, uh, you could hook, uh, you know, your HTTP library, your GoLang libraries, OpenSSL, and so on, and get data directly from those before the encryption, um, you know, or before they send. Unfortunately, again, U probes aren't very secure from that side because it requires the user to run um, the library that we're instrumenting, uh, and it requires the user not to modify the data after the hook, um, and these kinds of concerns. Um, Sometimes people put a sidecar inside the pod. Um, basically, this would be Envoy or Nginx or any of these kind of um, kind of proxies. Um, we we choose not to uh, for two reasons. Um, one, from a Tetragon side, it means we'd have to somehow get into this application and add a sidecar. Um, we'd have to be part of the pod spec, part of the deployment model. Um, not something we necessarily want to get into. Also, it means that this um, this group of of things cannot manipulate the networking inside their their pod. Um, this is a network namespace, like I mentioned, um, and we just don't want to enforce that um, this containers over here don't have cap net for some reason or somehow escape and get network ability to redirect traffic through the IP table. So kind of take a step back and say, all right, let's just not trust, trust this entire pod thing. It's a nice logical unit in Kubernetes to draw your boundaries around. Um, so given that, then the next question is where um, where should we hook um, for Tetragon to get um, networking data, especially application data at the L7 layer? I think DNS, HTTP, TLS handshakes, uh, Kafka traffic, these kinds of things that um, you know users of Tetragon want visibility into. Um, sorry, I jumped ahead there a little bit too quick. Um, and so where we we chose is this L7 SOC map. SOC ops. And the advantage there is that that's going to hook on the socket um, directly when the container or application sends the data, uh, but it's not going to be manipulated by the pod itself. There's there's not a hook or a method that the um, kind of a standard way for that application to detect that it's been attached to a SOC map where we're going to start running our BPF programs on their on their data. And there's no way for it to, to definitely no way to detach from it at that on that side, unless it has cap BPF and, and has access to the BPF file system. Um, another viable option is this host proxy. Um, if we could route traffic um, through the host, the problem with that for Tetragon is it requires a CNI, um, requires you to be in the networking routing table. Um, in Kubernetes, that would be the CNI. That's the sort of um, object that manages networking. Um, but for other systems, it's the same like principle. You don't, we don't necessarily believe that the security team is the same team as the networking team. Um, and so we just want to reduce friction. Um, okay. um, so that's where we come to the SOC ops, SOC map thing. Usually people call it SOC map. 
um, as a shorthand, it's actually a series of different hooks to build this system up. Uh, and so I, I will walk through what that looks like um, today. So if you look at how we do this um, uh, today, like I said, um, application is going to open a, a file descriptor. It's going to do it with a connect, most likely. When the when the connect happens, we have a sock ops hook in the kernel um, that checks the state transition. Um, and then the important thing is we look at if it's transitioning into an active established or a passive established state, um, and it's a proto kind of one of these families we care about. We run a run logic over that to see if we want to hook a parser to it. Um, that logic, again, you go back to those labels, namespaces, pods, kind of information from the metadata of Kubernetes, or it can be as simple as like, if it's port 443, I want a TLS parser. If it's port 80, I want an HTTP parser. And in practice, well, that actually is what happens a lot of the times. Um, the most common reason not to have it quite so simple is to do staged kind of rollouts. You may not want to all of a sudden start parsing every uh, every port uh, 80 traffic in your network. Maybe you only want to um, you know, parse traffic outside of your cluster or outside of some kind of safe domain, um, you know, IP addresses that you don't own, perhaps. Um, so that's the first step. And then after that happens, we connect it to one of our parsers. Like I said, um, that those parsers are, are sock maps or sock hash objects. So they're just BPF maps. It's a BPF map update with the um, with the sock as the as the the value basically, um, because it's a hash, uh, we typically use the um, file descriptor as the hash plus some extra data in case it's a UDP socket. Although we haven't fully enabled UDP yet for for Tetragon um, through sock map, to be honest. Um, and so each one of those has a BPF program attached to them. One is a message program to to um, parse data that's sent, and one is a verdict program to parse data that's received. Um, and ba basically what those get is the input of those programs is a like, scatter gather list of the data um, that's being sent. So then finally the application will send some data and then we'll get, um, we'll get our hook called. And there's some important properties of the hook. Um, the data that we're reading is not in user space. Again, for time of check, time of um, check to time of use, we don't want to like run our security um, algorithm over the data. All of a sudden, find that the user is changing it as we're trying to check it. Um, there's a bunch of helpers here that you can drop the traffic if you want. Redirect Cork. Um, Cork allows you to collect a bunch of data. Um, you know, we made the decision very early on that all of our parsers would be streaming parsers for performance reasons makes writing the parsers harder, but it um, gives you a performance boost because you're never blocking data. Um, and then on the reverse, on the receive side, the hook um, is just before the application receives the data. It's on top of the TCP stack. This is necessary because of uh, retransmits, out of order data. Um, you really don't, I don't think you want to try to write a TCP stack that handles retransmits and, and out of order in BPF programs. So um, the sock map hooks, um, in this case, the verdict program is after all of that logic from the TCP stack. So you can ensure that what you see is the actual data that's going to end up in the application, um, not sort of artifacts of the underlying protocol. Um, so then that's our sort of infrastructure for doing this. Then the problem is um, what happens when the data is like HTTPS or encrypted? Um, we still want to have uh, be able to observe the data and enforce our policies. Um, unfortunately, it's it's been encrypted, right? And so the problem is um, you don't actually see the data anymore. All you see is what what's in the TLS payload. Um, the use cases for this are, you know, here's some high level sli motivation slides. But I mean, the the real gist I think you can imagine is, is you have a an attacker in your network and they're going to try to send data out to some some bucket an s3 bucket or a um, you know some account that you have um, that you normally would allow from the platform but because it's an attacker you want to look at the data and maybe it's a uh, if it's encrypted you might not be able to tell that it's you know, not a valid token 
or not a valid bucket that you actually own. It might be an attacker, uh, attacker owned bucket, for example, if you're going to cold storage. Um, or vice versa, if they're pulling from it, you want to make sure that maybe it's a valid bucket for um, all the all the known folks to be pulling from, but not a valid bucket for your attacker to be pulling from. Right? In that case, you want to be able to look into the payload and or the headers and, and find that token and find that uh, or find that bucket or um, URI or or whatever the um, kind of significant thing is that you want to detect. Um, but again, trouble is this works really well, but in general, when it's not encrypted, we can use all of our programs to map to this. But as soon as it's encrypted, now we have this uh, this, this problematic thing going on here where we're just seeing encrypted TLS data. Um, and so this is just another dashboard we provide that we would like to work in TLS. The idea is based on tokens, you can, you can show how much data is being sent or received. Um, this kind of notion of a token is, is relatively common. Another thing that we want to keep, we'd like to keep working even in encrypted is to be able to inspect the payload where we look for kind of maybe compliance reasons that no credit card number should exist on the wire, um, these types of things. So you can scan the payload data. Um, this is sort of relevant because it means that we also want to be able to look at the payload, not just the headers um, from, a, from a plain text before it's encrypted. Um, the other thing we do is the TLS handshake. Um, this will become relevant in just a second. Basically, we parse the TLS handshake. It works for TLS 1.2. We get SNI names. Um, TLS 1.3 encrypts the cert, so we lose the cert in TLS 1.3. But there's that. Um, so we have all those dashboards, and, and we sort of understand that we want to look inside of this encrypted data to, to solve the use cases that we're solving without encryption, um, but with encryption. you know. Basically, what happens when we see uh, users turn on encryption all of a sudden is uh, all of their dashboards report zero, and they no longer have visibility um, into anything, right? And basically, they go drop back into L3, L4 visibility. So you can see the network connections, but you can't see the, can't see the data. Um, so how do we solve this problem in, in roughly five minutes? Um, you know, is first of all, we could tell you not to encrypt, but that's not viable. You're going to be sending traffic to um, kind of outside of your own network for starters into the into the internet. You really don't want to have unencrypted bucket traffic out there in the world, so not an option. Um, some some platforms go with the U probes. Uh, it's very convenient. You'll be tempted to try this. Um, you can, like I said, hook OpenSSL with a U probe and get the data before it's encrypted. Um, unfortunately for us. As a, as a sort of, again, security tool, like I said, this model doesn't work very well because we have to trust the user. And if our user is an attacker, there's no reason not to believe that they'll just, um, you know, manipulate the data after the U-probe or maybe not even use OpenSSL. Maybe they're just going to send the data directly um, somehow. So that gives us two options that we know of. Um, TLS termination is what we can do with Cilium today. And, and KTLS and BPF is what um, I'm talking about. Uh, from Tetragon side, our security tool. Just as a quick uh, a quick note on how the TLS termination works, um, I won't go into it in too much detail. But the basic idea is the curl or or whatever the application is initiates TLS normally, um, but you've injected a certificate into that chain, and so it's using a certificate and sending the data to your proxy, you know, whether that's Envoy or Nginx, like I said, or, or kind of any. Maybe it's a custom proxy that you built. Anyways, it gets there. Um, you can then decrypt it because you injected a cert into that um, application certificate chain. You can observe the data, then you um, then you re-encrypt it with the correct the correct data. This works, and we have to use this today. Um, that's a picture. You can go back and look at it later. Um, but the drawbacks about uh, kind of around this are one, it, it requires multiple encrypts and decrypts. So you're encrypting, decrypting viewing the data, then encrypting it again. So in both directions, you're adding adding more operations. Um, from our side at Tetra, or working on a security tool, we don't necessarily own the, the networking. Um, so there's a problem about routing inter integration. Like how do we get the CNI? Uh, the CNI, again, is the component for Kubernetes that does networking. But the, the problem is really how do we get the, the data where we want it? Um, certificate injection means you're managing certificates. Um, and you need a way to do that. You also need to know what certificates to inject. So you need to know where your applications are going to um, where your applications are going to send packets to, and that's usually by DNS name. So you would need to know 
um, all of the endpoints that every application in your network is going to um, send data. And this can be done, but it, it, it's an extra complication. And if you have a rather large network, you can imagine this can get complex um, rather quickly. Um, and then the last piece, it just requires DNS parser integration, usually to make all those kind of pieces work together nicely. Hey, John, that time oh, check, three, yeah, three oh, minutes. Three minutes. What's up? Are you just giving me the three minute warning? <laughs> um, yeah, so, so what we chose to do is use KTLS. Um, the difference in the KTLS flow, this is basically the same thing. The only major difference is we go from a TLS parser initially to an HTTP parser. So we parse the TLS handshake, and then we transition to the HTTP parser. Um, how we do this is we also monitor the set socket options to see if KTLS is turned on. Um, and I think, I hope I mentioned it earlier, KTLS is the TLS offload that pushes the, um, the data path of the encryption down into the kernel so that the handshake is in just in user space and then the actual encryption happens in kernel. The reason we, we like that is because um, now when you do the send, we get the plain text in the kernel, we do the encryption after the BPF hook. Um, and this way we keep all of our observability and dashboards working really great. I don't think I can do a demo because I don't have an, any idea how to switch to my laptop from here. So I just stuck the, um, I stuck it here um, basically, this is a, we have a gRPC hook for Tetragon. This is hooking up a CLI to it. Um, I just pretty prints the events. And what you can see is I did a curl to ebpf.io slash Tetragon. Um, it does a connect. We get all of the DNS info from the DNS parsers, um, along with the application that's doing it. You get some socket data. This gives you some stats about those UEP connections. We close. Finally, the connect for the TCP. We get the TLS information from our TLS parser, which tells us that it's 1.3 and AES and GCM and all this good stuff. It then transitions to the HTTP parser where we get the we get the kind of the data on the URI and the and the and the method get and touch are going here. Finally, it's closed and the exit. So that the really kind of critical pieces are the DNS, the TLS, and the HTTP parsers here. All right, I'm over time, so I'll do a really quick slide here. Um, sometimes people like go, wait a second, this doesn't, like BPF can't do this. I suspect there's not like a lot of controversy in this room. Um, last week I was at a conference and there was more controversy about what BPF could do. I think a lot of that stems from folks having a kind of a five year delay on their BPF kind of world, like what BPF can actually do. Um, but you know, a lot of it is, well, you have bounded loops, you must terminate, you can't do a parser without bounded loops. Um, the feedback on that is, well, um, I don't know of any parsers that want to run forever. If you look at all of your parsers, usually they're bounded because, well, you don't want a malicious packet to cause you to loop forever and consume CPUs. So that's not really a problem for us. And then there's always this question of like, is the header limits too small? Can you get enough, you know, parse enough data? Um, we're roughly in the ballpark of what Apache does at the moment. There's not too many problems um, now that we have function calls, now that we have um, kind of bounded loops, we haven't hit a whole lot of problems. We've not even had to use BPF loop up to this point. Um, we just open coded everything and it seems to work fine. Um, sometimes we hit this, this error, the sequence of 8193 jumps is too complex if we get too many jumps. But you know, so far it's been without much trouble, we've done a, a fairly good job. Um, and then I'll skip to the last, since I am over time, the, uh, the kind of next things that we're working on um are uh, trying to get some of our testing available for folks we have a fairly significant testing for sock map internally for at least for tcp um we we do a lot of the compliance tests that are required for nginx and apache um and they're all passing now on the latest lts kernels and bpf next um, unfortunately we just do that for a very specific tcp configuration so that's that's one thing um the benchmarks are looking pretty good but i i was I hesitated to put them in here until somebody reviewed them. I'm um, just because I didn't want to claim something that was too good to be true. Um, on KTLS, um, if you're interested in this, come find me or email me, ping me on Slack or something. I need folks to add more um, KTLS support to go like Java, Python, Boring TLS, and so on. Um, more testing on all the versions. So um, if this is sounds like fun, um, come track me down. And we're always building better parsers. I want a regex parser, but that's not there yet. 
And that's it. So um, with that, I will um, say thanks. Um, glad to talk to you guys. And if you want, I think because we're out of time, if you want to put something in the, um, the chat box, I'll definitely uh, respond to it there. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you, John. Let's Sorry, I rushed through there.